Hello and welcome to this Be Heard Amplified Town Hall, Onwards, the Future of Arab American Activism. We're joined in this venture by our partners at the Yemeni American Merchants Association, as well as the Arab American Association of New York. Arab Americans, defined as individuals with ethnic, linguistic, or cultural origins to Arabic-speaking countries in the Midwest or North Africa, now, that's a very flat way to describe a truly multidimensional community that has some of the most diverse and dynamic people in all of the world who happen to reside here in the U.S. Before we begin our conversation in earnest, there is one more partner who I'd like to introduce you to. From the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, here's Commissioner Bita Mostofi. Hi, I'm Bita Mostofi, Commissioner for the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and I'm so excited to be a part of this incredible conversation. So many of us, particularly here in New York, um, can remember what it felt like when uh, the news first came around the Muslim ban. Um, I know personally, as an Iranian, um, how that made me feel. Um, and how much it sort of sparked or resurfaced feelings after 9-11. But I think that there was a difference in what I personally witnessed um, between the two. And by that I mean the community um, immediately sort of understood that sitting back and remaining silent around incursions on our civil liberties around racist or discriminatory policies that hurt us and our families and our, and our livelihoods and our contributions. Um, it's not something that we can sort of idly sit by and accept. And we saw that not just from within our communities, but also from uh, the, the broader public. And I think that message of solidarity in particular is a critical one. We must remain active. We must remain vigilant. We must ensure that the, uh, the empowerment and the realization of so much of our efforts these last four years were not about turning the clock back, but about finding a path forward that is more bold, that is more just. And I think that's a place that all of us can find some hope in. And I look forward to being able to do that work with so many. Thank you, Commissioner. And speaking of immigrant affairs, these guys have the art down to a science. I'm talking about the Brooklyn Nomads. They're a collective of musicians from different cultural and stylistic backgrounds, hailing from Lebanon, Germany, Sudan, Turkey, Iran, and the US and Albania, among others. But right now, they're coming to us from the Brick House Studio in downtown Brooklyn.
Thanks to the Brooklyn Nomad, sounding good from the Brick House studio. Now I'd like to introduce you to the four panelists who will be joining today's discussion. Samaya El Ramayim is a Yemeni American activist, founder and director of the Women's Empowerment Coalition of New York City. Thanks for being here. We also have Vetna Monasir, a community organizer and the executive director of the Yemeni American Merchants Association. And Yama also happens to be a partner in this venture. Thanks for being here, Vetna. Yafa Diaz is the lead organizer at the Arab American Association of New York, which is also a partner that we're very happy to have on this endeavor. And Mohammed Missouri, the executive director at Jetpack. Thank you all for being here. So before we begin our conversation in earnest, I'd like to take you back to 2017 at a time when activism was very much at the forefront of everyone's mind on the heels of a hotly contested election. Have a look. I think Islam hates us. There's something, there's something there that there's a tremendous hatred there. There's a tremendous hatred. We have to get to the bottom of it. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Our country cannot be the victim of horrendous attacks by people that have no sense of reason or respect for human life. They have no respect for human life. I come from a legacy and an ancestry of women and um, of an entire cultural religious group that has been oppressed and marginalized. When I think of my grandmother who came from Palestine to Jordan as a refugee, or my mom who grew up in refugee camps um, coming to the U.S. as an immigrant and having to experience Islamophobia here and immigration issues here, they are the women that I hold in my heart and they represent all of the other women in my community, and that's why I march. You say you can make America number one. How you make America number one if you put the crime and the hate in the people hard? You have to stop this. You have to stop it. Enough, it's enough. We not can accept it anymore. Why hit me? For the hijab or I am a Muslim, I am an Arab. Why hit me? Uh, everybody here equal. Everybody here uh, equal. There were a lot of communities that um, really wanted to make a statement about their identities, about intersectionality, about the issues that they're facing and that they're going to face under Donald Trump. And my executive director, Linda, and the people that she's organizing with saw this as an opportunity. Why don't we help organize, bring in voices of women of color, bring in intersectional issues of communities that are marginalized and um, not represented. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sumaya Rumail. I'm the advocacy instructor and woman organizer at Arab American Association of New York. I'm marching for all women, for Arabic women, for Yemeni women who didn't get a chance to go. Some of them are still like scared of what is going to happen next. There's probably going to be more people than we have seen. We, a bunch of, you know, Arabic women from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, the largest Arabic neighborhood in New York City, um, we're all going to get on a bus together. We're going to head to D.C. from Brooklyn. You excited? Yeah. Are you excited? Yeah. See the people. Well, yeah. This is a dialect. United. United. My name is Maha Sarsour. I march because, as you see, I'm Muslim. I'm going to defend myself and my other Muslim sisters in America. My name is Tamir Judah. I'm a Muslim. My whole family is Muslim. And the comments that Donald Trump made early in his campaign about even thinking about putting the ban on Muslim is not right. My name is Hanadi, and yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I am marching for these three right here, <laughs> my children, <laughs> for their future. Sisters and brothers, you are what democracy looks like. Sisters and brothers, you are my hope for my community. Women's rights are human rights. Women's rights are human rights. This is 
is what democracy looks like. In the U.S., like there has been this idea that there's a women's rights movement, but oftentimes the movement is still led by white women. Um, it's led from like white Western feminist perspective, and it doesn't really take into consideration women of color, the identities of women all around the world. Show me what democracy looks like. I think that like the whole point of this march is to counter the idea that we're all siloed and that we're all working on different things. We are all affected by these same systematic policies, right? So the same policies that criminalize youth of color are similar to the, the policies that criminalize Muslims. And it's the same forces that are enacting these policies. It's the same surveillance equipment, the same budgets, right? And the same politicians pushing these things forward. We are here, we gonna stand with all communities, with Arab communities, with Muslim communities, with black communities, with LGBT communities. We are gonna stand with all who's looking for equality, who's looking for freedom. I'm seeing this as a place where we can find some healing, find some just solidarity with communities, um, get a little bit of hope and energy from finding masses of people out there supporting the issues that you are working on, supporting each other, going down with, you know, thousands of people who I may not know, but like will create an atmosphere of love. And I think that's something that we need as organizers. All of them love the United States of America. All of them want America to be great, but it's not in Trump way. It's in our way, with love, with peace, with equality, with no racism, no Islamophobia, only love. <laughs> So we're starting our forward-looking conversation with just that briefest look back at what was 2017. Samaya, you were there. You felt the energy and the pull to get yourself on the bus and make your voice heard at that huge demonstration that we saw. I wonder, looking at that and seeing where we are right now, how would you define what it means to be an Arab American activist right now? I saw this movie and you brought me back to 2017. And I remember how it was like really hard for us, how we, are, we were shocked after what Trump, he said about Muslims and how we felt the pain. And we started like, you know, like try to find ourselves as a Muslim and Arab and organize ourselves and making sure that everyone hear our voice. Um, I feel like now we are more stronger than before more organized um, and more bold. And that wasn't before like that. I felt like before we were like still scared, like especially like, you know, Arab people who are coming from overseas, especially new immigrants, they didn't know exactly what is their rights in this country and how they can be heard. And if is that gonna affect their um, uh, like, you know, visa status or like can get the citizenship and not gonna impact them. It was really hard in the beginning. And because like after what happened with Trump that time, I was like, you know, um, just get hired as a woman organizer and advocacy instructor at Arab American Association it was like almost like two months before that. Yeah. And I was like, you know, like, you know, I, I have this energy. I want to do something. I want to educate women. I want to do this and this. And I was like very lucky to be under um, Linda Sersor uh, supervision and learning from her. We had this energy. We want to do something. We have to organize our community. And the first time for Arab community to mobilize like four or five buses that day, like to DC and to have women be in the bus to go to make sure that their voice is gonna be heard and people are gonna say like, no, what, what that happened, that's really crazy. And that was like really the worst nightmare that Arab American went through. And I cannot believe that, that 
we are out of this nightmare, but we still have so much work to do and we will not stop. With regard to that work to do, Vetna, I'm looking at you uh, as the director of the Yemeni Americans Merchants Association. I know in 2017, I was walking in Brooklyn and I happened to pass Brooklyn Borough Hall one day and there was a sea of people out there who were making their voices heard as the Yemeni American merchants just shut it down and came together. And I was like, I went on Facebook Live and started sharing with everybody like, look at this, look at what's happening and this energy. So same question for you from 2017 to right now, what does it mean to be an Arab American activist now? I'm going to be very frank. I never thought in my life that I was able to advocate for my community until I felt like I was forced to do so. Going to elected officials or lobbying um, was something that I never thought was possible in our community because growing up in a very conservative community, um, we didn't have a push uh, voter advocacy or a push to get involved in um, elections. You know, I was part in 2016 with Hillary Clinton when I was the first Muslim woman to actually join the forces um, to try to get the President Trump um, out of office. Um, so that was something that our community was not even ready to see women being advocates or advocating on those issues. Um, but I felt I had to as, as a mother of three boys. To me, I don't feel like I only represent the Arab community. I represent all Americans who come from different backgrounds, especially immigrant backgrounds. Um, so going back to what you said about the Yemeni community, that, was, that is why I joined Yama. Because I never thought that the Yemeni community would come out in this force, um, not only for the diversity visas, um, not only for the Muslim No Ban Act, the war against Yemen. Um, I feel that is, I had to be that voice. I have to push myself to show my children and people abroad and at large that um, I'm an American. I'm an American too, and I have a voice. And it doesn't matter your race or where you come from. Being born in this country, we know we're privileged. Um, and why can't we not use our rights to be able to be outspoken uh, when our rights are taken away from us? I mean, this is just a land of the free, but it really, we're not free in our own country. So I feel like it, I was forced in this role and I'm actually so happy that my community pushed me to be that voice for them um, and take a leadership role and something that I never thought that was able to do so in 2015. So I'm, you know, and again, I'm proud to be a Yemeni American who sees a community that is striving and growing and, and pushing out a voice um, in which when I was growing up, we didn't have that in the Bronx. I mean, I didn't come from Brooklyn. I came from the Bronx in Little Yemen. Um, now we have Little Yemen, but I, come, I came from the Bronx in New York and, right. you know, Gulf Wars was, that was, you know, we were targeted all the time as a kid. So we were trying to be sheltered and not, not be too out there. And yeah. now that I can have a voice, I'm, I'm really happy that we can be the voice, a reason for the community. Listening to that idea of having a voice and this idea of being sheltered versus using your voice and fighting for rights. I'm thinking, Muhammad, about the work that you engage in for greater visibility and using those voice and breaking barriers between what really is and the perceptions that we're forced to sort of endure. I wonder how you see that and the role that you have as an activist in 2021. What Fetno is just talking about kind of resonates, right? Because I think. Um, when I entered this uh, this work, I was very much think you know I think a lot of people feel this where you're thinking. For me, for instance, I was entering politics you know many many years ago because I am getting up there in age. <laughs> it's been a while now. It's uh, you don't want to be, be be pigeonholed as you know the Muslim activist or the Arab American activist, or even honestly from my perspective like the person who they come to to talk about foreign policy issues, right? Um, when, uh, cause it's always like a reactive thing, but I think after 2017, uh, there definitely was a jolt that's, you know, that's being described here so far in the community. And, and I felt it myself where I felt, you know what, this isn't, we're not going to be free, um, or safe or, you know, no longer going to be targeted systemically by our own government, you know, uh, in a country that we love if we don't organize. So I think, you know, for us, what I've seen, it's, it's. It's both, you know, it's, the last four years were obviously in many ways a curse and, and I'm never going to, um, you know, I'm never going to like let let go of the fact that a lot of people were very hurt, both here and abroad. 
by a lot of the terrible policies that were enacted. But at the same time, I think when we look at it long term, the energy that it, you know, that the way it energized our community, Arab American, the Arab American community and getting involved more in, and that doesn't just mean like marching or calling our legislators, but also actually putting resources behind organizations, right? When like, you know, those of us who reach out to people and say, hey, you know, we're doing this, we've got this, you know, we're launching this project, for instance, about representation. So like for Jetpack, for instance, you know, we want to see more, more Arab Americans, more Muslims specifically really, uh, but also other people who are underrepresented in government, we want to see them in government, whether in elected positions or working on campaigns uh, or, you know, in advocacy positions, we want we want to increase that representation by providing uh, essentially tools that people don't necessarily have in our community. So when you reach out, when you do that outreach now, it's interesting because like you can even have, you know, people who are uh, formerly Republican, right, in the community who go, well, I used to be a Republican, but like I really see now, for instance, the value of not just like voting for my tax, you know, rate, but I'm actually voting for all these bigger, larger issues. And I think also like last summer, what you're seeing um, a much more interest in the Muslim uh, in the you know Arab American community uh, in actually deal being allies um, against you know racial injustice, especially targeting you know Black Americans. So I think like those things. Just like that raised awareness by people it is really um, and seeing it be sustained over so many years and knowing that it's probably not going to go away. I think, you know, some of us had concerns that it might after, you know, Joe Biden won. But uh, what I'm seeing is, uh, you know, a sustained effort by many people in the community to actually increase our representation and to, again, back people with resources, which has, you know, for a very long time been really completely lacking. I saw Yafa, I saw you nodding your head as Mohammed was speaking. I know that you as a lead organizer at the Arab American Association of New York have been doing so much work with getting young people, especially interested in voting and making sure that people are registered and engaged. And as he was speaking about resources and sustaining that energy, I know that you all are fighting on multiple fronts. I want to turn some of our attention to the most present threat that we are all facing right now as a world, this pandemic and its disparate impacts. Like you hear a lot of stories about the pre-existing conditions and how it's decimated uh, Black communities and Latinx folks. But there's been a lot of silent suffering that's been happening in the Arab American community here in Brooklyn with regards to this pandemic. How are you at the organization been working to combat that and all of the other things that are swirling around? Thanks for that question, because it's uh, definitely one of our top priorities to serve our community within the Bay Ridge area or Arab Americans in general. It definitely has been difficult. Uh, we saw a lot of holds during the pandemic for the first three months on folks who needed anything regarding their green card, uh, social security, uh, whether also like EBT food resources, financial assistance, rent, um, all of it came down swooping so suddenly. And so um, at AAANY, we actually never fully really closed. We made sure that we were um, online available consistently for our community, whether it was advocacy, social services, um, mental help, um, any type of ESL programming, we made sure we moved it all to the virtual world. And even for folks who didn't know how to use that, we trained them and we led workshops and we made sure we were available. And if we weren't, we made sure we had the resources by the city of New York so that they can receive the assistance they wanted. During the first three months, we definitely pri prioritized a uh, food bank. Uh, we um, had uh, collaborated with the city and we were able to get boxes, especially during Ramadan. And then NYIC actually granted us a, um, a grant where we were able to give undocumented uh, families a small um, gift card or a visa card that they can actually use for groceries or their rent or any type of um, home assistance. And so 
uh, during this pandemic, I would say it, it definitely hasn't been easy. We saw the stress on our community and we've been attempting now more than ever to um, help as much as we can, especially since folks want some kind of sense of normalcy back in their life. But all we can do is currently be here and consistently be here and show them that we are, which is why we're always either outside or we're here on the phone, online, AAA and Y will always be here to service the community during this uh, pandemic. Samaya, I know that you actively have been engaged exactly in the same way for the duration of the pandemic. I wonder what you would like people to know about the impact that this pandemic has had on the community. We hear about the pre-existing conditions that are no strangers to folks in the community as well, but I wonder how you have been seeing the impact and what we can say is a sort of never again moment now that we get a reset after the pandemic. Uh, because like, you know, uh, it's like through the pandemic, people, they weren't prepared that's gonna happen to them. Many people, they lost their jobs, many business owners, they lost their business. And also like, you know, people, they couldn't even afford, like afford to pay like the rent. It was really hard on them, especially because um, our, my organization, it's like in uh, uh, Sunset Park and Bay Ridge, it's like uh, supporting South Brooklyn in general. Mm -hmm. And like in South Brooklyn, like there are a lot of people who's undocumented, even they didn't uh, get any support from the city it was really hard on them. And many of them, they have like, you know, little kids who's really get hardly impact of this pandemic. And many parents, they even couldn't uh, support their children in, uh, in school with um, like, you know, remotely learning. It was really hard on them. So we were focusing and like, you know, uh, train their parents how like to use the technology, how to use Zoom and how like, you know, to deal with the new norm. Uh, of education, it was really hard. And many parents, we all helped them out to get printers and also tablets, uh, laptops for their kids. And also we helped many parents with like, you know, um, we, we did fundraising and we helped them with their rents and like paying some uh, bills was really hard. And the, the, the worst things that face us that there is like there is no more much resources for undocumented people outside and it was really hard on us like to like keep supporting like all this amount of people it, it's really hard but we were very lucky to um to um partner with the campaign against hunger and also with uh, brooklyn bar president office like helping out with food and we had done so much work with uh, food distribution and especially with deliver food for uh, olderies and people who's like uh, cannot leave house uh, that was like the things like that we were focusing on because like many organizations like Arab American Association Yama they were like you know distributing food uh, for the communities but like wasn't uh, actually it was really hard for them to do delivery but we had this capacity we had many volunteers who volunteered their cars to do this food distribution. We were very lucky. And also I wanna give a shout out for South Brooklyn Mutual Aid. They had done so much work also with delivery uh, and giving food for the community. Thanks for these thought provoking points. Before we shift to our next topic, let's go back to Brick House and check in with the Brooklyn Nomads.
Thank you again to our house band, the Brooklyn Nomads. Now let's get back into the conversation. A moment ago, uh, Samaya was talking about uh, the struggles of folks who are undocumented and largely left behind by a lot of these relief bills and are still not being made whole again as we march toward some sort of sense of normalcy now. I know you've spoken extensively about this concept of invisible people. And you also are working directly with people who are so on the front lines now, who are the merchants who were still there and keeping our community supplied. So I wonder how you and your membership are reconciling this threat of being frontline workers and essential, while at the same time taking care of folks who are quote unquote invisible. We actually are part of the United Boga, uh, Bodega of America and the city and the state to vaccinate our small business owners. Um, and that's from our merchants to our owners of poultry. Um, we've actually scheduled hundreds of vaccines uh, for, our small, uh, for our small business merchants, as well as different um, elderly in the Yemeni community. Uh, we were also able to do so um, and have them who are undocumented to actually get approved to go there um, so that they're not afraid. Um, so that is something that we're pushing forward um, we have built a large capacity for our community in which um, since um, I came, we were able to do a lot of organizing. So I'm really, my background is organizing. So when Mohammed said organizing, I was like, that's, that's me, you know, I'm an organizer. So building capacity um, and having the community volunteer, young, like children of merchants like myself, um, helping and educating the community on vaccines, um, notion in Arabic and English uh, town halls, educating them why they should get vaccinated, why it's so important to their family, um, how we can support their efforts. Um, also learning about small business loans, um, also pushing out with the city to educate um, merchants on how to get those loans, how to do accounting, um, merchant services. We did surveying the community. We really pushed out an initiative to make sure that our community was um, able to get these services. Because um, sometimes people think because they're undocumented, because um, they can't leave work or they don't have the resources to get that, um, you know, so we are really pushing out. And um, with the whole COVID crisis, we're learning how to organize virtually. We're learning how to organize the community, phone banking, text banking. We're organizing the community and letting them know we're still here for you. Um, and that is really something that, unfortunately, it's, it's really been a terrible thing of having COVID, but we've gotten closer to the community understanding their problems. We didn't know they didn't know how to get small business loans. We didn't know um, they didn't understand what vaccines were. They, you know, like things that we take for granted. And um, this was a great educational course for us in Yama to understand what's our needs and the support and the financial support we've gotten from the city and the state and from the community members. Um, we've been grateful for, especially the food distribution, rent relief, rent relief for business owners too, not just, right. huge, not just people, but people, businesses have employees and they need to also be able to run businesses. So that has been something that we've been pushing forward for. I think that just that shift in focus that you said from like, this is making us realize what's needed in the community to help to fill in the blanks where we didn't know we didn't know until yeah. it was in our faces. But Mohammed, I know that your organization has done some work with a far reaching survey that sort of prioritizes and shows us where the community's voices are leaning and what they want to hear and where their concerns are. I wondered if you could share a little bit. I know health was one of the primary concerns even before the world changed on us. Sure. I mean, and before that, I just want to say that, you know, on that, what you just mentioned and what Bettina was just talking about, I think about the, um, you know, the, the invisible, right? Like the invisibility of, um, yeah, I think invisible is the right word, not in, not indivisible there. Uh, it's that, um, you know, there are, because Arab Americans have to check the box, uh, you know, like check the white box or the Caucasian box on a lot of, on the census, a lot of, you know, official surveys, what happens is that there are a lot of the, cons you know, a lot of the problems that exist uh, within the Arab American community, the way we're disproportionately impacted uh, by COVID, uh, but also by other issues, um, you know, they're underreported. Right. So I think that's like something we do have to, to point out. And I think there, there have been uh, anecdotal evidence from physicians saying that uh, Arab Americans are disproportionately harmed by COVID. 
because you know you've got the there, there are issues with with health disparities like hypertension, diabetes, and, and some heart disease. Uh, but there's also the fact that a lot of uh, Arab households, especially you know recent migrants, um, you know living in multi general households, um, and therefore being more at risk of actually spreading you know spreading COVID. Um, but also uh, in terms of you know a lot of the new immigrants, obviously they 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 are essential workers as well. So they've been m targeted more than others. So I think that's just like something that has been very much underreported in the news. But you know, thankfully, we do now have again like a, a raised awareness about speaking out when we see these things. So when when this this disproportional impact has happened, we're seeing physicians speak out. We're seeing you know Arab American reporters at the Huffington Post and you know, at the, at the Washington Post, at, in the Boston Globe, you know, in different places where they're now getting these jobs and seeking these important roles that they're, you know, actually reporting on these things. So I think that's something that's a, a positive, you know, in, in the negative, uh, within the negative, like, you know, last year. As far as like surveying is concerned, I think our work, which is done in collaboration with a lot of, with many other groups, uh, what we're seeing is that, uh, and it's, it seems to be very consistent that even though Arab Americans do care about foreign policy still, of course, like I don't think anyone um, would be telling the truth if, if they said that that's no longer an issue that we care about. Um, we are seeing that again, like especially the last three years, more and more people are engaged in economic issues. And what we're seeing there is that it's specifically economic justice issues, again, which is a shift, I think. I think, you know, in the past, uh, Arab Americans used to vote Republican. And we're seeing a shift that they're voting Democrat now again after after 2016, uh, in you know a significant majority, and then which is over 60 percent, which I consider a significant majority, and then we're also seeing uh, you know again that they, healthcare definitely is an issue, healthcare costs specifically, and so I don't think you know we feel comfortable based on our survey saying that there's a to take the leap that Arab Americans are supporting Medicare Medicare for all necessarily in large numbers still. But I do think definitely the the population is trending towards you know a different healthcare system that uh, essentially centers affordability m much more so than anything else, and actually guaranteeing it is a right. So I want to uh, encourage everybody now that we've all heard your voices and get to see a glimpse of how smart you are. This is a part where we can have some crosstalk. You don't have to worry about being called on. This is just us sitting around the table talking like we talk. So if something sparks something, feel free to jump in. Because I know even when, uh, Muhammad, you mentioned the idea of whiteness being the default for the census not making space to encompass the full community. I know Samaya, you've been doing a lot of work on that and you've all had this sort of intersectional work that happens around mutual aid, the BLM movement, working with the AA, uh, PI community as well in the wake of things that have happened there. Like none of us are siloed. I see all of your faces at every single demonstration. You show up for all of the people, but I'm just looking at you, Samaya. I wonder if you could talk about some of that impact work that's happening with mutual aid and also this idea of being able to check off who you are on something like the census. We worked actually um, making sure like to, that people filled out the census and get counted because it's really important to us as an Arab like to mark uh, that we are Arab and get like since how many Arab are in the city. So how we encourage people, we were thinking about like a way that we can encourage people to fill out the census application to do voter registration at the same time because with the pandemic people, they just like wanna, don't wanna do anything. They just thinking about how to pay the rent, how to get food. That's all what they were thinking about. But like they didn't think about that all what's happening with us, it's because we didn't fill out the census right in 10 years ago. And also we didn't vote the right people who can represent us and help us and support us. So we were thinking about a way that we can encourage people at the same time doing mutual aid, helping communities. Um, and we started like announcing, if you're gonna fill out the census with us, you're gonna get two boxes of food instead of one. If you're gonna do like, you know, you're gonna do voter registration with us, same thing, you can get like, you know, two boxes. 
Um, so like, that's how we get people start like, you know, yes, we want to do it. We didn't fill out the census. Yes, we didn't um, like register to vote. And we got like a lot of people who are coming uh, to us like to do that because they want extra food. This is a way that you help them at the same time and you encourage them to fill out the census and also do voter registration. Uh, and it was really smart way. Um, and I, I also helped like where I used to work at um, Academy of Medical and Public Health Services, which is serve uh, Chinese and Latino communities and also some Arab. And that's like, it's really, I, I saw it, it works with the Arab community, with Chinese Latino community, it works with everyone. And as a people of color, I think it was like really important a step, like to make sure that people are like filling out the census and also um, like register to vote so we can choose the right people. So Yafa, one of those things that I'm listening to is the needs were identified, but we need political will and we need political power to demand the resources that the situation calls for. And I know in 2020, by some numbers, 80% of Arab Americans actually showed up to the polls and voted. So somehow 20% of the people escaped you. But I know that you are out there doing so much work. Tell me why the voting and the representation matters in your eyes, even building on what Samaya was just saying. Just representation in general is so excruciatingly important. I think also after the years that uh, folks have suffered, they realize, like Arab Americans realize, um, I'm gonna go to this poll. I'm not gonna start just looking at the bigger picture of like, okay, these two candidates, oh, they're both evil. Uh, we're not gonna get anywhere with them, no. They realize that on a local level because of AAANY and all the education workshops and all of the effort and times and tablings that we've done, uh, that on a local level and on a bigger on a bigger state and federal level, we do have the power to make the change. And that's why I believe that so many of our folks went out there, went out to the polls because not just for themselves and their family, but also for their own country back home and also for their community here, they wanted to make sure they were properly represented and heard. And that's why so many of them were out in the polls, which I'm very happy about. So looking at the landscape in America, there is probably about six major cities that can like claim that they have the largest population of Arab Americans who are living here from like LA, of course, Detroit, all up and down, Chicago, yeah. DC, <laughs> New York. So why haven't we seen those populations transfer into representation? Like the fact that I can name like the four people who are in like Congress or the Senate is yeah. proof that we don't have critical mass here. So what's mm. the disconnect? How, for all of you, how do we translate those numbers, those voices and that power into representation in those bodies? And does it even matter? Does it matter that there aren't as many as there can be? Yes. Yes. I think- No, I think go it, ahead. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm joking. I just wanted to say an affirmative yes, it matters. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I was, I was, I was going to add to that. Um, organizing the community on um, identifying voter IDs is so important. Um, you know, Yama, now we have a C3, a C4, and we also have a PAC. Um, it's so important that we educate our community in identifying them. Um, now that we have the van, uh, we can actually educate the community by knowing who they vote for, why they vote, who doesn't vote, how do we register voters, um, and that's something that, you know, coming to the Yemeni community and engaging them on, on voter, you know, issue and legislation and advocacy work that they can be involved has been very helpful. And identifying who votes in our community, who doesn't, is also helping us on their issue-based policies that we're trying to push. Um, and advocating them when we do lobbying. Um, you know, even C3s have 30% of legislative lobbying. And we've been lobbying legislators throughout the United States they're heavily populated of Yemenis from California to Michigan to New York. Um, I live in Florida, so I'm working remote from Florida and from um, New York City. So uh, we have a large community and the Muslim community is a large uh, voting block for swing votes. So we have to kind of push that issues of how do we organize the community? And the best way to organize a community is by voter files, uh, voter IDs, engaging the community on surveys, on advocacy work, um, I just found out the Muslim, Yemeni community 
Uh, we have so much immigration reform. Uh, we have a lot of criminal justice reform. We have a lot of issues that, you know, by serving the community and issue-based policies, we were able to have conversations with elected officials. Um, and these, these meetings are open to the community, um, not just to the Yemeni community, but to the Muslim community at large and those who are, are facing any immigration reform. Um, so I think that there is tactics of how do we do this? How do we do that is identifying the voters, identifying the community's needs and engaging them. And if that means phone banking, text banking, organizing them on issues they care about um, and registering voters. I mean, we did the census, we had, we had um, the city gave us 138,000 um, Yemeni Americans. When I looked at the voter files, we're much more than that. You know, uh, our ethnic model is not represented. Um, you know, I, my name is Vetna Monasar. That's not a Yemeni name, you know? That's not even Arab or, I mean, that's not even a Muslim name. So, you know, my sister's name is Susan. You're not gonna find Susan, you know? So, <laughs> especially when you're third generation American, um, you know, our parents are giving us American names. Um, so, you know, also learning how to identify the Lebanese community has the same thing. Uh, we're, we're also Arab Christian and we right. have some Jewish Arabs. So we have to make sure that when we identify the community, there's different issues for different community parts of our community. We're so diverse. My thing is like, we have to gauge the community as voter IDs, you know, Sumeya said, um, you know, engaging them and making sure what they want or, you know, inviting them. Um, I know in Florida, we're not allowed to um, give any in incentives when we go to voter, to get out to vote, right. but we do um, host events and, hey, you know, come out, we're, we're registering, you know, people to vote. You know, it's a, it's a poll party. It's a block party. Let's, let's get it. You know what I mean? And, you know, community, they love parties. They always want it. They're always going to a wedding. So, um, and those are, again, you're educating the community. Are you, are you voting for this? You know, are you, are you, how here to vote on your C3 hat? If you're a C4, you know, you can do more on an advocacy legislation um, mm -hmm. and, and identify issues. So there's, there's ways to tax the community. And I think that we all in these organizations have those resources. And this is the where we're gonna be pushing the initiative for the community at large. So Mohammed, if I may, can I ask you to expand on your yes? And specifically, I'm really interested in this idea that America woke up the day after the election, the most recent presidential election and said, oh, the Hispanic vote. There is no one Hispanic vote. And as Vetna just illustrated, that broad swath of people who fall under the umbrella of Arab American, how do we even begin to approach what is the Arab American vote? Honestly, that is a really, really tough question. I mean, I will say first to your first um, question about elaborating. Yes, I'm happy to elaborate because represent <laughs> representation uh, matters is obviously something that I that I, I mean, I believe to my core, it's why I do the work that I do. I think when you're looking at, you know, why 80% of, of Arab Americans voted, which is a pretty high, high number, obviously, uh, you know, all things considered, we obviously would like it to be a lot higher, but it's still, in the grand scheme, that's a big number. Uh, and it's also an increase from years past. I think, you know, they're definitely, you know, Bernie Sanders energized a lot of people across the Arab American uh, community. I would say that's definitely true. I mean, in terms of if you look at the at least the Democratic primary, he was extremely popular in, in exit polls and, you know, and just surveys being done uh, and, you know, through anecdotal evidence as well. And, and it, a lot of that has to do with his very authentic style of like politicking, which I think was very unusual, is very unusual. I mean, I can tell you that in the past, trying to get people to vote uh, in our community and this is, you know, I'm not going to paint with a wide, wide brush here, but like I will say, like anecdotal, you know, stories, it's like, you know, you'll ask someone to do to do that, especially people who are immigrants, first generation Americans, and then you'll get the answer, at least in our, in, from Arab Americans, right? Like I've heard that like my entire life, they're all thieves, right? Like all politicians, because that's like what, what, what they associate with politics from back home. So that doesn't, I don't get the same response anymore, because you saw this stark, stark difference, right? Between like the Donald Trump and you know, now Joe Biden, for that matter. I mean, first, I would say it was Bernie, but like people definitely got, you know, got around to accepting that Joe Biden is not the same <laughs> as Donald Trump. I think that was a huge, uh, you know, a huge shift. I think initially some people m maybe felt that, but that's, you know, we've gotten away from that. And thankfully, it's being backed by the policy changes that we've seen so far. You know, I mean, it's still early, but some of the initiatives are very encouraging, not so much on foreign policy and immigration yet. 
but on domestic issues, economic justice, you know, some of these things, labor rights, uh, voting rights, even with HR1, we're seeing, you know, the administration follow through with some of their promises, um, primarily because they're pushed by, by the House in Congress. And who's doing the pushing? Who are some of the biggest voices? You're, you have Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. You've got Congresswoman, you know, Rashida Tlaib. You've got Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, you know, Ayanna Presley. Those are some of the biggest, you know, um, biggest voices for some of these policies. And we can't look, you know, and, and the truth is like that, you know, some of these people, none of them, I would say, ran on the idea of like, oh, here's my identity. That's why I'm running. Right. But a lot of what they're running on, a lot of the things they fight for, it's informed by how they grew up. It's informed by their li lives. And that's why representation does matter. And so like that's like one aspect of it. The other aspect from like a longevity perspective and sustaining like Arab American, I guess, um, in this case, we're talking Arab American, like, uh, you know, uh, the community getting uh, used to voting and, you know, answering surveys and, you know, like to Vetna's point, even agreeing to do voter IDing, right? Like those things that can sound like tedious and some people can't see the connection between like doing it today and actually having, you know, results in the long run. But for people to get engaged, it's like, when you hear Congresswoman Tlaib, you know, do that outreach for you, right? When you see Dr. Abdullah Sayed on CNN weekly talking about these things, when you see like a Vetna and all these other people in the community being vocal and, and having a voice uh, that is actually being amplified by Arab Americans also in the press, it, you know, it, it, it becomes a sustainable thing, right? And that's like why, why representation is so important because you, you realize, okay, so there are people like me doing this work. And, you know, there, this, especially like from a relational organizing perspective, I mean, there is nothing more effective than an Arab American reaching out to an Arab American or, you know, a, Latin, a Latinx person reaching out to a Latinx person to say, hey, this is why it matters, because you can speak about it from a very personal perspective. For any organization that really cares about getting out the vote from an underrepresented group, you need to make sure that you hire people who look like the people you're trying to reach and who sound like them and who understand them. That's a great point. I, I see you smiling down there, Yafa, about making sure that the people who do like the outreach are the people who you want to see in the end result as well. And I know for you and even Samaya as well, the way that you've been able to bridge and work with different communities, uh, we all know about what happened in um, the AAPI community and the hate that they've seen. And it seems like it's just mirroring the things that happened after the September 11th attacks. And it's like the same garbage that a community has to deal with just shifted according to what's happening in the news cycle. So I'm wondering just about this idea of coalition building as political power becomes more dispersed in the community and people are waking up to what's happening and the opportunity to sort of build those bridges and connections to move us all forward if we're talking about the future of activism. I just want to like, you know, go back a little bit to your point about representation. I have been working for Arab American Association, like at that time when, um, when Father K ran for the office and I had to take like, you know, a vacation to work in his campaign. Uh, I, I saw how the Arab community in South Brooklyn were like, you know, energized to see an Arab man, the first Arab American Palestinian who's running for the office, who is going to represent them. And I remember how people, they were really energized when I volunteer. Um, like we registered more than 1,200 people to vote, like in within a month. Uh, because the people, they were like, yes, we want to see an Arab who's like, you know, representing us, listening to us. Um, and I feel that it's really matter and it's really important for Arab community to see someone who looks like them and have been through a lot like them. They, and he understand the struggle and the challenge that face Arab community to represent them. After that, after like Trump got elected and the Muslim ban was one of the most like important things that happened to the Arab community and makes them like energize that, that they have to be more engaged, civically engaged and like to vote. And this is how we, I, I actually founded Union of Arab Women, who's a woman in like from our, uh, it's women from our district who cares about like the future of their children and how they can advocate for, for, for the future. And how it's going to look like the future if we just going to let everything go as they want. So 
when I have those, like, you know, when I founded this um, club, it was really hard in the beginning. I started educating them and it was really for us a um, big step to have Arab women making sure to register women and making sure that people from our community go voted. And that's how we turned the district blue in South Brooklyn. And we got Andrew Guinardis and Max Rose that time because of the work that Arab women had done uh, at that time. They, it's, it's like, you know, when you build trust between you and the community, people, they start like, you know, yes, we like you know they want to do this work and they want to be like more engaged because they know the women who come to them and ask them to go vote or to register to vote it's really important to have people from the same community doing the work and then like you know the next step that we were thinking about how like we can call because we are as a people of color under attack whether you are muslim or not muslim so how we can build this coalition, how we can be more strong and powerful, how we can move forward and build this future for us. And that's how I started. This is the idea how I started building the Women Empowerment Coalition of New York City. It's a coalition that build, um, it's empower women and educate women and build bridges between different community, between, I mean, between communities and um uh, moving forward to build better future for all of us. This is, was the idea, making sure that because we all living in the same district, we have like, you know, Latino, Chinese and Arab and also Black American, and we do not get a chance to get to meet each other. We meet each other, it's not to, meet, to work with each other, mm -hmm. to get to know each other, to get to think about our future together because we all having the same struggle, the same problems and the same challenges. And we all make minority communities and we should work together. That's how we started. And I hope like it's going to be like, you know, we can like do something big for future. Well, speaking about that future, I know that Vedna Solidarity work has been important between uh, Yemeni bodega owners and folks who are Latinx as well, breaking down some of those barriers and for all of the sort of silos that we were put into. But I'm wondering, looking at that video that we had from 2017 when everybody was fired up about the Trump election, I wonder where's the fire now? How do we keep that same spark to make sure that we push the needle further for the next four years because the work isn't over just because that person isn't in the office anymore. So that's what I, I would like for everyone to be able to walk away with that same sense of urgency and spark and say, where are we now and how do we keep going and not lose momentum? We're going to end it, I guess, with visible. We want to be visible, right? We're indivisible, but we want to be visible. Um, and I think by different routes from lobbying to rallying to calling your elected officials to educating members on town halls um, to register the voters to getting all that engagement and being visible and sound i think that is the move that we want to push we want our community to be visible we want our community to be to be seen and to be heard and i think by doing so and collaborating with other organizations um, in New York City is going to amplify us. If we all, the Arab community, organize together as organizations and people like we are in this, on this call today, I think we, have, we, will, we will knock the ball out of the field, like my son always says, you know, uh, playing baseball. We, we could do this. Um, it's not hard. Uh, putting down our egos, pushing forward for a community building. Um, I, I did it in Florida and it was one of the hardest thing I've done in my life. And I had to, you know, swallow my pride sometimes and you got to push, right? Stakeholders, we're all stakeholders, we're community leaders and we need to work together. And the only way we can do so is by building that foundation together and being visible because um, we all represent different parts of the community. Mm -hmm. And if we, sh if we come together, just like the Latinx community does, you know, we work greatly with the, the Hispanic community, with the bodega owners. Um, and we have a, a, a sisterhood and brotherhood together. I'm in mean, the fight for merchant services. We can also do this on a platform, on a political platform. It's new for us. I know our community is new because uh, Mohammed said the trust of leaders and internationally when they're coming from places that have dictators, um, it's not, you know, still having that trust issue. I think we are in a point in our lives in the community that 
we trust each other. We know we have the best interest for the community. So I think th this call of today of having us together here is actually bringing us together, um, understanding what, what we're trying to push out on our initiatives and how do we collaborate um, and engage our community on at large. Yafa, I know that you are one of those people who's been knocking on the doors, who's been walking in the streets, who's been organizing, <laughs> right? And doing all the things. So I wonder, how do you make sure that people don't just say, oh, Trump is out, you know, I can take my ball and go home now, things are better. Like, how do you keep them focused? Through our youth. So our youth program is so amazing and they're so empowering. And I never used to be this active when I was young, but times have changed and they don't stay quiet. Our youth have been participating in so much civic engagement. They did census um, last year. Uh, they've been uh, participating in our city council. They've been uh, learning how to do testimonies and testifying. And to me, something like that would have been so jittery, but they're not afraid. They're like, I, I have the right to be on this. You're going to hear what I have to say. And then you better come back with an answer to city council members. And so it's so amazing to see how engaged they are, but also that they come to us for leadership, for assistance. Um, and so one of those ways that like we actually really got out in the community is through our youth and also through our women empowerment program that Sumeya um, had mentioned before, who was also a part of empowering our women at AAANY. Um, through the women and our children, we've discovered that uh, we've made a bigger impact in our community. Those young people always put me to shame. I just feel like the oldest old guy. But Muhammad, as a man who's approaching age as well, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, I don't like I'm about to ruin this Bill Gates quote, but he said something about people always overestimate what they can do in two years and underestimate what can be accomplished in 10, like something to that effect. So with that in mind, looking at the sort of short term and long term, what do you see us using the fire for that can really impact and change the community move forward in the next two, 10 and beyond using that young energy? That's exactly it though. You're hitting the nail on the head. And you know, to uh, Tiafa's point about youth and, and women being uh, leading this charge in our community, right? It's it's really why I have such hopes. I mean, when I started doing this work a couple of years ago, like this very specific work to our, you know, increasing uh, Muslim representation and and BIPOC representation, uh, in my mind, it was a twenty year project because you're talking about you know a, a community that's in its infancy essentially in terms of organizing, right? And and in, in order to get to a place where, I mean, you said earlier. Um, you know, you only have, uh, you know, one Arab right now, I think, American in Congress, right? And it, it, that is a really small number, of course, uh, you know, all things considered. But what we're seeing down ballot, what we're, you know, having Colorado elect its first Arab American state legislator, in, in, you know, in Iman Joda, which is Palestinian American, and having Indiana, of all places, elect, you know, its first Arab American uh, Muslim man if, to their state senate. Uh, in Fadi Kadura, like those are things uh, that you're seeing, you know, we're seeing that people running again and like for, for bigger things. You've got three Lebanese, you know, Americans running for mayor in Dearborn, right? Like that's, uh, granted, it's Dearborn, I get it, right? But it's still, like, that's still progress. Um, and the fact that, you know, they're not just three people running, they're three people who are seen as, you know, all very viable candidates, right? So, What's really encouraging, because I was concerned about, you know, what's going to happen right after Joe Biden gets elected. Um, what you're seeing, though, which which removes some of that concern is that, it, you know, the, the women and the youth running things. But also you really are against seeing people with resources actually understand, like because the community is very giving. But oftentimes it's been, you know, giving to charity that like, you know, abroad oftentimes, right, like trying to figure out. Because to deal with a lot of the, you know, like hunger, poverty, other things that exist in other countries, they now see the connection between policy changes in the United States. And, you know, in this case, for instance, like, let's say foreign policy changes, their people are finally seeing those connection points, which has been a long time coming. But I think actually, you know, just make it's our job, all of us here, you know, and other people who are now working in these different organizing communities to make sure that donors, that just like the community in general continues to understand it. 
And I think because we have so many new groups that have popped up over the past three, three to four years, like we're talking about, I don't know, we're probably reaching a hundred different groups across the country, if not more, of doing very specific organizing work related to policy advocacy. That's, you know, that's very unusual. And that's, again, like th there's a lot of energy and that's really the just it's our job to make sure that people stay energized. And I'm pretty confident that we're going to do it. So in the service of staying energized, I'm going to ask each of you to do the most unfair question that I'm uh, able to ask today. So in four words or less, I'm looking at you, Vetna. I want you to describe to me what we started with. And the rest of you, it's coming up too. So get your thinking cap on. But the short answer for what activism has to look like to be relevant from now for the foreseeable future. I was trying to say five, but I'm, you said four. So I'm Hit me with, with five. five. You're first. Yeah, Go okay. for it. We have to be visible. We have to be visible. Samaya. Bold and visible. Nyafa. We need to stop being scared. Speak up. You got to be unmuted, like you just unmuted yourself. <laughs> Mohammed, bring us home. I'm going to say loud and apologetic. Unapologetic. All right. That's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate the time and the thought that you put into this and the work that you do every day that delivered you here. We really appreciate you. Thank you for taking part in this Be Heard Amplified Town Hall. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. We also want to mention that the Brick Be Heard Amplified podcasting classes in Arabic and English are in full swing right now. Presented with Moya in partnership with AAA NY and Yama, make sure you're listening out for their individual podcast this summer. And now to play us home once again, the Brooklyn Nomads.